But then, and also, you know, Chuck, you know, he, he, he talked at length about growing up in, in your home and, and your parents and how they fostered vocations for the entire family, and it was, uh, yeah. Yeah, they just did it by their own, really. Mm -hmm. uh, Mom never asked me. Mom told me that she had always prayed that one of her children would be a priest or a sister. But she never asked me. Uh, but they simply raised us in a Catholic environment, a Catholic home. And my gosh, they, they had 12 kids. I mean, we saw the dedication and the sacrifice that is involved in a vocation just in their own. And so uh, I think we sort of breathed it in the air of the house we grew up in, in that sense, yeah. So, and you've been in Bryan pretty much. I mean, is your, your... Yeah, so I didn't go far. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going further now yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to Tulsa. Uh, I grew up uh, just about uh, eight miles north of here. Uh -huh. And uh, I grew up, and when I got out of high school, I was not intending to go to college. I didn't, <clears throat> didn't want to go to college. So in high school, I worked half a day, went to school half a day, and that was a, a track in high school that did not prepare you for college. So I went to work for the USDA Veterinary Toxicology Lab at Texas A&M University in high school, delivering mail. <laughs> that was my first uh, job with them. Then I moved into the uh, animal caretaking department. It was basically managing the livestock of the experimental center. And uh, we took care of cows and pigs and sheep and goats and horses and all kinds of stuff, both here in College Station at the, at the facility we had here and then on a little ranch we had out uh, south of town. I did that until uh, I was 20, mm -hmm. and then I went to work as a machinist. So I really found my love in uh, machine work. Mm -hmm. uh, started that job as a night job, as an additional job. And then after working nights at it for a month, quit my day job and went to work full time as a machinist. Worked there for five years, small little uh, uh, mom and pop kind of a shop here in town. Uh, about a year before I entered the seminary, I bought into the, the little company. Me and the owner became partners. And then a year later decided I was going in the seminary and so sold out of it and, and I went off into the seminary. But I was 25 by the time I started college in the seminary. Yeah. And how you, got, you ordained in 93? 95. 95, okay. So normally starting a seminary as I did, it would be a nine-year track. Four years of college, four years of a graduate degree, and one year of a pastoral intern year. In my case, I found, while I was in the seminary, a great love of monastic life. I did not know anything about monastic life when I entered the seminary, but I was majoring in history. And uh, Catholic history, of course, is filled with reforms and monasteries and religious orders of monks and nuns. And so I became very enamored of the Trappists. And in my, after my first year of theology, uh, decided I wanted to try to enter Gethsemane Monastery in Kentucky. So I spent basically a year working through a process of discernment that involved visiting the monastery, doing some discernment retreats at the monastery, while continuing to finish my class work and so forth in seminary, ultimately deciding to, to come back and stay with the diocese. Um, that caused me to then uh, enter a kind of a state of, of confusion and discernment about just my own diocesan vocation also. And so I took a leave of absence for a year out of the seminary, and that's what extended my seminary years to 10. So when I joke with people that I was very good at seminary and managed to stretch it out to 10 years, that's why. Uh, ultimately was ordained at the age of 35 on my birthday, Which on third. my 31st birthday, 35th birthday. And uh, seems like a very short time ago. 
it'll be 21 years this year, but it seems like a very short time ago. Now, you, 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 did you start in the campus ministry as an associate here? Uh, this was my third assignment third as assignment. a priest. Okay. I had been assigned first to a parish in Austin for just a short time, 16 months. Then I moved to a parish in Temple, Texas, a small uh, town in, in our diocese that has a very large hospital system. Uh, so the town itself is actually quite populous for being a small rural type of environment. Um, and so this was my third assignment, and then it was also my fifth assignment, <laughs> because I was assigned here for three years and, and 10 months or so, and then I went to work for the diocese as a vocation director for four and a half years, and then came back here to be the pastor uh, here. Ultimately, though, your, your heart really is in the ministry at St. Mary and, and has been. Right. So. In terms of the 21 years that I've been a priest, um, almost 15 of it have been here. Mm -hmm. And so uh, campus ministry is what I have done the most and what I have loved very deeply. Mm -hmm. What are your sentiments then on, on, on leaving uh, St. Well, Mary? it will be hard. Uh, it will be hard to leave just for all the obvious reasons it, it would be hard for all the obvious reasons that it would be hard no matter when I left and no matter what I moved on to, to leave, uh, to not just leave and go to another parish in the diocese, but to leave and leave the state altogether, uh, to leave my family. That would be uh, difficult, but also a blessing. Uh, they understand that it's a blessing. I understand that it's a blessing. Uh, Tulsa, I look very much forward to to getting up to Tulsa and, and beginning the ministry there. I've already had through this process of the announcement and the tour that we did in Tulsa with the press conference and all that, and just the conversation back and forth so far with the staff, the various members of the staff, the priests who have reached out to me by email and phone and sent messages and cards. I already got a, a package of of welcome cards from a kindergarten class at one of the schools. <laughs> so uh, all of those things have shown me what a wonderful staff there is already put together there, how great a shape the diocese already is in. And then my natural love of the outdoors, one of the hardest things to leave for me here in Texas is my little getaway place in Lampasas, which we'll see tomorrow. Um, I've got a 30-acre place out there where I can go and just be alone and spend time in prayer and reading and reflection and also working, cutting cedar trees and building roads and building sheds and cabins and all the things that go with a 30-acre piece of property. Um, that will be hard to leave. On the other hand, the bishop's house is beautiful and on a beautiful 10-acre lot, and so there's a lot of natural beauty in the area, and so I think it'll all work out. Uh, I know you, you, you talked about it briefly uh, in Tulsa, but what was your, your initial response to the phone call from the nuncio? Yeah, well, the, um, the phone call from the nuncio caught me on a very ordinary day uh, in the office trying to hurry through a number of different little tasks like anybody who works in an office is trying to hurry through. And being distracted by the, the computer that was somehow was trying to print something and I couldn't get it to, to print. And the call comes in from the receptionist desk that says there's a man on the phone. So I pick the phone up. And I'm not quite connected to the call when I'm first listening. I'm still distracted by what I'm doing. And he's saying this is... Archbishop uh, Vigano, the papal nuncio to the United States. When he got to nuncio, that's when I finally caught up with who was talking to me and what, he, what the call must then be about. And uh, that was a moment of 
amazing focus. <laughs> when I finally caught on to what was happening, um, everything else that I was doing all went away, that's for sure. He uh, told me that the Holy Father had appointed me to be the bishop in Tulsa. Would I accept? So I think it was just a short time of me not knowing what to say, being so surprised by the fact that this was actually happening, that he started to speak again because uh, he may have thought I dropped the phone or something. <laughs> uh, but uh, I told him, yes, I would accept. And then when the call was over, I had to come over here to the chapel and spend some time just trying to get my head around it. And it went on from there. Um, how, how's your perspective? I mean, after the initial shock and the prayer, how, how's your pr perspective changed over the last several weeks then um, from your visit to Tulsa now coming yeah. here in this transition time? Yeah. Uh, a wonderful thing, a wonderful part of that morning was that the very next call that I got was from Bishop Slattery. <clears throat> so. As you all know, Bishop Slattery has a very warm and genuine uh, demeanor and personality, and especially on the phone, this very uh, uh, soft voice on the phone. And so that was very comforting to get a chance to visit with him. I'd never heard of him, met him, known of him, and then the next call after that was from my own bishop, Bishop Joe Vasquez, who we laughed together because I'm sure that a bishop who calls someone else who has just been told that they're going to be a bishop is always sort of laughing at uh, the predicament that the other person <laughs> is in because I, I likened it, I was talking to somebody and I said I thought that it's probably similar to when you're with a friend who does a belly flop off of a diving board and you know how that stinks because <laughs> you've done it yourself and so you know he's going to be okay but you're laughing at his predicament because he's hurt him. So something like that. Um, so that was a fun and wonderful call. Uh, then I couldn't say anything. Bishop Slattery and I uh, decided that uh, the 13th would be the, the day to announce it, and this was the 4th, so I couldn't say anything for nine days, and that was very hard. That was very hard. I was in that part of our staff work here at the Student Center where we go through a, a year-end review of all the different programs and things that we did this year, and then what are we going to do next year, what should we change and adapt to. And we also have a year-end leadership council meeting, so in campus ministry, in our form of campus ministry, we don't have a pastoral council, we have a statewide leadership council. So we pulled all those people in twice a year, and this was the time for that year-end meeting. And other donor and benefactor events that have to do with the campaign that we're in now, so all these different things I'm going through that have to do with the future and how we're working and what's going on and I'm not able to say anything to those folks and so that was a very challenging uh, few days and I was very relieved when I finally got to Tulsa and we were able to make the announcement and uh, start the process of planning. So as things have progressed and in working with the staff and all and getting more and more of the details ironed out for the ordination, then the excitement is starting to build into to the event itself now and to starting life as a bishop. And so that's where it is now. What are your, what are your hopes uh, for your episcopacy? Uh, well, I hope that I, as a bishop, that I can be what the scriptures call a bishop to be, a person of prayer, uh, a person who has a great concern for the people who have been entrusted to him, and a person who is a teacher and who is the main preacher of the diocese. I hope 
to spend a lot of time out in the parishes, uh, visiting all the different organizations and groups in the diocese. Um, I hope to spend perhaps the first year just getting to know people and getting to know what's going on, learning what is Tulsa and what is Oklahoma and uh, what are the people doing and what are they hoping for out in the diocese and uh, continuing the great work that's been going on already. Uh, bishop Slattery has done such a wonderful job as a bishop himself that I step into a very good situation. In what ways do you think the, the Lord has prepared you for this in terms of hey, all the time at this campus ministry, which is a, a very large and active uh, ministry, with a large staff? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there are some natural ways in which uh, the work that I've been doing is a preparation for this higher level of uh, organization and work. The staff that we have here at St. Mary's is now probably about 35 people. Uh, we're dealing with a student population, Catholic student population of about 17,000 people. We have about 55,000 uh, family members, former students, donors, benefactors, members of what we call the Aggie Catholic family in our database. As I was doing today before you guys came, I spend a couple of days a week on average driving around the state visiting with people. So those are all things that are similar uh, to what a bishop ends up doing. Uh, meetings, working with different organizations and groups, driving around a large geographic area. Uh, and then the bishop's motto that I've chosen is from the beginning of Psalm 127, which says that unless the Lord builds the house in vain to its builder's labor, my prayer each day begins in silence in the chapel before the tabernacle, reciting that psalm to remember that this day and every day is the Lord's day and it's his business, what he wants to do with it, and my job is to simply follow him. And so that became the natural motto because it's been my my touchstone, my foundation for all the time that I've been here in this ministry. Uh, what are the, the greatest challenges do you, you think for the church uh, right now um, in, in, in this cultural context? Well, a challenge I think that we face in the church is uh, helping young Catholics in particular, but also all of our Catholic uh, people to really understand that to be a Catholic is to have a very personal and real and deep and intimate relationship with Jesus. To not know things about Jesus, to not be a Catholic who merely knows things about the church and who merely knows that, well, I know the church teaches this or the church teaches that, but I don't really know why and uh, those things don't impact my life. But instead to be a Catholic is to be a person who is choosing actively each day to be a disciple, to love the Lord, to seek his heart, to understand his will, to recognize how the church is his body, his gift, his bride, and then to live as an active Catholic in the world and to practice one's faith in the church because of him, because of the Lord. In my own life, that was the, the path of my own conversion, to grow up and to become, by the age of 23, a Catholic who knew a lot about the church and a lot about what happens in the church and so forth, but who hadn't yet made a really serious and deep commitment to being a disciple of Jesus, to living my life each day actively striving to follow him. And then when I did make that commitment, everything changed. The adventure really began. This is by far the latest and greatest chapter of that adventure, 
but it is an adventure. It's a, a great joy to test oneself against the Lord's will, against the love of the Lord, to, to see, can I do it? How well can I do it? You do find that when people engage, people engaged in that adventure, that's the, the true attraction then of, of faith? Yes, the way that the Catholic Church must live its mission in the way in which the Catholic Church must bring the Catholic faith to every other person on the planet, that's the mission. The way it must do that is through attraction. By us becoming the best Catholic disciples that we can be, that's how others will see in us something they don't have and that they want. They come to see that they want what we have. We certainly don't have anything because of ourselves. We certainly, the church is not great because we're great. We're sinners. The church is great because it's the Lord's church. We have been given an unmerited gift. So now, how can we hold on to it now that we've received it? No, we have to give it away. We have to help other people see how great is the gift of the Catholic faith.